Good evening, everyone. I love services like this tonight. The gentleness and the, the way the spirit gets so gentle and moves. Well, greetings and hello to everyone um, from Bill and me. We've been in Virginia for a couple of months. Did anybody miss us? Thank you, thank you, thank you. And we had to um, take care of some business dealings, and, and we didn't get them all done, but that's okay. So we decided to come home for a little while because it's almost Christmas, and the real reason was it was so cold there. Good grief. It's so nice to be back in Florida. Well, tonight is Healy Wednesday, and tonight this message is going to be real simple. No heavy doctrine, no deep theological terms. And what I'm going to do tonight is talk to you about the God of hope, my story. Now, I want to start out with some scriptures because anything you have to say, if you don't back it up with the Word of God, it's not worth much, right? We have to go with what the Word of God says. Let's start out with what Paul says in Romans 8, 24 through 26. Now, um, this is really echoing up here. Um, Romans 8, 24 through 26 says, For in this hope... We were saved. Now, Paul is talking about the redemption of our bodies at the time. But he says, now hope that is seen is not hope for those for who hopes for what is seen. For if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. And then the familiar scripture, likewise the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought, but that very Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. In other words, the Spirit intercedes for us while we are waiting in hopeful expectation with patience. Okay? Now, I'm going to make a statement. You'll hear it a couple times tonight. Life is not fair. Can anyone agree? Life is not fair. It was never promised to be fair. But we are promised that we do have help in times of trials and tribulations and in our sufferings. Now, I'm going to give you a couple of scriptures you've heard many times before. 1 Corinthians 12, 31 and 1 Corinthians 13, 13. And it says, now eagerly desire the greater gifts. And now these three remain, this is talking about the greater gifts, faith, hope, and love. We always hear sermons about faith. We always hear sermons about love. I mean, understandably so. God loves us and we walk by faith, right? But seldom do we ever hear how to apply these scriptures about hope to our life. Yet it is necessary because hope is called one of the greatest gifts. Why? Because faith is right now. But hope is based in the future. Now, verse 25 in the Romans passage said, We hope for what we do not see now, and we wait for it with patience. Hope being one of the greater gifts we are instructed to desire. So hope is so important to God that he said through Jeremiah the prophet, Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord's plans to prosper you and not to harm you. We hear that all the time, right? But it also says plans to give you hope and a future. Now, Hebrews 10, 23 says, Let us hold unswervingly to the hope that means tightly not wavering not wavering that we profess for he who promised is faithful so we're instructed to hold on to your hope we always hear about faith but it says hold on to your hope now remember I said life is not fair when life is not fair we're instructed to lose to not lose hope because it's a very powerful force in a person's life Proverbs 13, 12 says, hope delayed or hope deferred makes the heart sick. Now, what we need is to notice or what we need to understand is when a person's heart is affected, remember it's the heart that makes the connection between the physical and the emotional. And when our spirit has lost its hope, it will affect our physical body. And we have to trust God even when it looks like the answer is not coming. Even though it may look like God is not healing, 
God is in the midst of our sufferings. And even though it may feel like God is not healing, it may not feel like it in this body. God is in the midst of our sufferings. God is at work. And as long as you hold on to hope, God will come through. Let's go back to the basics. Where does our hope come from? Romans 15, 13 says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with power of the Holy Spirit. Because hope is a belief, but it's also an expectation. And our hope is supposed to come from God. So our belief and our expectation has to come from God. Because he's the God of hope. Now, Remember I said that life is not fair? Remember? I want to tell you a story about hope. When hope was all I had. Now, I look like an almost 65-year-old woman that's got a spring in her step. Looks like I'm in great health. Then I am. I am. But I want to tell you where I've come from. Now, some of you have heard parts of this before, before, and please bear with me for those that know the story. But there are many that need to hear this tonight. Over 25 years ago, I was married. I was in the ministry. I had a great secular job, and I was living a pretty good life. And then life turned upside down. I became divorced. I raised a 13-year-old along, alone. And some months later, I was sitting in my office at the bank, a beautiful 100-year-old bank with all the ornate um, ceilings and such. I was at the height of my profession, and I looked at that 40-foot clock tower and that fall evening, and I said, Lord, I don't belong here. I thank you for providing for me, but I don't belong here. I belong in the ministry. You see, there was a longing in my heart to be doing what I was supposed to do. And then about five or six months later, my divorce was settled and I was in my office again. I lived at work. And then something strange happened to me. Three prophets over 10 days appeared to me. I knew none of them. So it had to be from the Lord. And the first said to me many things, but the most important was, and you're going to hear a theme throughout this, seek the Lord. He would be with me. I was not alone. Well, I certainly felt alone because I was a single woman with no family around. A week later, now that was odd that someone would come prophesy to me. But a week later, a second prophet came by and said, I have been praying for you for nine months. Isn't that great? Somebody had been praying for me for nine months. I didn't even know. And she said, you're going to be okay. But the battle has just begun hey, I just came through a divorce. What more could you want? You know? And she said I was to remain in ministry and the Lord would guide me and provide for me to seek the Lord. He is all I needed and the Lord would provide. Okay, that was nice and encouraging because you see I had kind of stepped out of ministry and was kind of hanging on the back seat at church recuperating from all the disappointments in life. The following week came, the third week, it was really about 10 days later, and a third person came and prophesied to me, and she said, the Lord had brought her to me to give me a warning. She said to me, your life is getting ready to change, and it will never be the same. You're getting ready to go through the midnight of your soul. Things that are now will not remain. Seek the Lord now. You will walk through the darkness, and in the midnight you will turn, and you will be turned. But God is with you. Seek the Lord now. And oh, by the way, the ministry that you've been in, it was always yours. Pursue the ministry. Continue. And looking directly at me, this really freaked me out. She looked directly at me, and she pointed behind her, and she said to those walking across the floor, she didn't even look at them, she said, beware, you have many enemies that are jealous and seek to destroy you. Seek the Lord. You'll need to prepare for what is ahead of you. Seek the Lord. Hear that seek the Lord part? Well, that was not fun. But I wrote everything down that I could remember she said. Seek the Lord. 
So I began to think about the things that have been said to me. And now, mind you, I'd never been prophesied before. I mean, I really didn't know what to think about. Of course, I called my best friend because, I mean, you have to tell your best friend. Because, see, I had not come from a church where we had a pastor that walked around the congregation seeking the Lord for a word for someone that might need it that the Lord has it for. We didn't have that. So for me to have three people to come and speak to me, that was really odd. And I knew that I was really going to need to reflect back on what the prophet said because there was just something that told me that. And then three days later, everything that had been prophesied happened. And thank you, Jesus, I'd been warned or I'd lost my hope and I would not have survived. On a cold January day, I was walking across the floor at work and out of nowhere, I was walking across the floor, something caused me to fall. Now, I just didn't fall. I went flying through the air and I crashed the back of my head on a marble floor. My employees said the sound was so loud, they thought that I had been shot. And when I woke up, I remember the first words I said, devil, you may have caused this, but you just wait and see what the Lord does with it. Where did that come from? Where did that come from? Boy, I had no idea what was in store for me after those words. Now, I'm going to sum up to you what happened to me that day. I had a closed head, skull, traumatic brain injury that resulted in something similar to shaken baby syndrome. My brain had been shaken in my skull. The rear portion of my brain was severely bruised. The frontal portion was detached and bruised. My neck had injury to my vertebrae and the disc, and my shoulder and my hip were traumatized. To make a long story short, I was in the hospital, and I was released, and I slept around the clock for days due to this traumatic brain injury. My doctor said I should have sued him because I should have never been released. But three weeks later, I painfully tried to go back to work as the manager of 22 people. And my immediate boss, a VP, she was merciless. I mean, she wanted someone that could do a job, right? I mean, everybody wants that. But she had no patience for me, an injured person. And she was one of the enemies that the prophet had warned me about. Those first few days, I turned on my computer and I couldn't figure out what to do next. Everything was a blur. Nothing was familiar. My reasoning skills no longer existed. I couldn't remember anything. In fact, I lost a lot of short-term memory and a lot of long-term memory. And in the following three years, I had 21 doctors and specialists in rehab. I went to cognitive and physical rehab for three and a half years. And finally, again, after five years, my neurologist told me this kind of injury reaches its highest degree of healing in two years. And from two years to five years, you might see a little glimmer of hope. I didn't. After two years, not much had changed. And after five years, maybe there was a glimmer. My left side was uncooperative when I was tired. My leg would drag. I walked with a cane for about 14 years. I couldn't lift more than a 14-ounce can of soup. I couldn't reason well enough to make any decisions. I couldn't cook. I mean, I really should have taken stock in Wendy's. And I had flooding sensory overload, so I couldn't be in large groups for very long at a time because of the noise and light. I couldn't go to the grocery store because of the flooding. I'd get dizzy and I'd get a migraine. I couldn't find stuff on my list anyway. I lived on coffee and I would go, this I remember so well, I lived on coffee so I would go to the coffee aisle and there'd be all this coffee in front of me and I couldn't figure out what to get. I mean, it was just a big blur. So my friend went and got a case of Starbucks for me from the food pantry at our church. So I had Starbucks, a whole case of it. I suffered from undetectable mini seizures that were only discovered because of the microwaves, because of the migraines that lasted about 12 years. And those migraines would last anywhere from days to weeks. Now I'm not talking about waking up with a little headache for a couple hours. I'm talking about migraines for weeks. I was completely debilitated for years. And before God healed me, my last migraine lasted three and a half months. I couldn't function. 
that last migraine caused me to miss Valentine's Day, my anniversary, my niece's wedding, my birthday, Easter, and Memorial Day, and that migraine kept me in bed mostly for three and a half months. And because of my pain, anybody ever lived in pain before? Because of my pain, my depression was deep. But but because it was from a brain injury to the hospital, the doctors didn't know what to do with me. So they put me in the psych ward for a few days to experiment on me. And they gave me meds that they said, these meds will knock an elephant on its butt, guaranteed to get rid of the pain. It did nothing for the pain. So they knocked me out. You can't get rid of the pain, so let's just knock her out. And then they'd give me black coffee to decrease the swelling in my brain. That's why I got addicted to coffee. I was on seven to eight uh, medications, three for pain, one for seizures because I shook so bad, one to help me focus, one to help me sleep, one for anxiety, one for depression, and one for nausea that I just remembered that I had not put on here. And because your nausea is so bad when you have migraines, and because the fall did so much damage to my skull, my neck, and my jaws, I couldn't open my mouth more than an inch. So I couldn't eat. I had no appetite. I failed every taste and smell test they gave me. I lost 25 pounds less than I am right now. I was bone thin. I was emaciated. My hair fell out. My skin was terrible. My nails popped off. I had deep black circles under my eyes, and I looked like a drug addict, and rightly so if you're on seven or eight medications, right? And what was worse, I had no idea how bad a shape I was in. Had no idea. In my memory, well, that really hurt my relationship with my daughter because I can no no longer remember some of the experiences that we had together. And she needed her mom. She needed all of her. She needed her memories. Now, in the darkest night of my soul, I felt abandoned by God. Would you feel abandoned by God? I knew it wasn't true, but it felt that way. And I would ask, God, why would you allow a single woman, no family, that had spent her last 20 years committed to ministry, be taken out like this? Why would you do that, God? Why would you allow me to suffer so badly? Where are you, God? I've lost everything. I've lost my home, my job, my health, my family, my finances, and what looked like a future. And God said nothing. I felt the way Job must have felt. So what did I do? The only thing I knew how, I spent every waking moment in the Word trying to find answers and strength. And the depression and lack of ability to focus forced me to put scriptures all over the house. Now, please hear me, everyone. People go through depression for a lot of different reasons. And I hear a lot of antagonism about it. Please understand, I couldn't do anything about the depression I was going through because my brain was swollen and was for months. And when you're depressed, the reason I put scriptures all over the walls is when you're depressed, you can't remember to read the word. And you can barely form words to pray. So, what did I do? My thought processes were so erratic, I couldn't pray, so I wrote them out. I wrote my, script, my scriptures out, and I wrote my prayers out to God, because I couldn't think long enough to have a conversation with God, so I wrote it out. Now, during this time, I was well aware that I was needing to pursue ministry. It was very active in the local church. I took some counseling courses, led the singles ministry, had a prayer group. And every moment I was not engaged in church, I was asleep. But there was a problem. I could not concentrate long enough to prepare a doctrinal statement or a thesis to defend my faith in the ministry I was getting ready to be ordained in. I had to do that. I could only sit at a computer about 15 minutes at a time, and then I would become fried and get a migraine, and it would wipe me out. Life was not fair, and this is not what I am supposed to be doing. This is not the life that God had for me. I just didn't understand I knew that God loved me, but the enemy was having a heyday with my brain. 
and I felt nothing but despondency. And being so tiny, 100 pounds, 105 pounds at 5'7", my body was wreaking havoc also physically. Now, I knew that God had called me, yet the enemy had caused me to stop living life, much less pursuing a future. And still, every time I doubt it, God would send someone in my path that knew absolutely nothing about me to prophesy his love and his desires for me. Yet, how was it going to happen? I couldn't see how it was going to happen. So, because of my flooding or the sensory overload, I went to a quiet little church to be in God's presence. In fact, I left some of the louder churches to seek out the quieter places just to be in God's presence. And I had my name on every prayer list in the country. I went to prayer service to receive healing, but I finally gave up because I couldn't stand anyone to touch my head, my face, or my neck. And when I was prayed for and someone touched me, it made it worse. I even told the evangelist uh, in this one thing I went to, thinking he had some common sense not to hurt me. <laughs> I didn't say it that way. But you know what he did? Bopped me on the head. Oh, thank you, Jesus, for these people. But anyway, it added more pain to an existing injury. So that's why I started seeking out really quiet places. No more prayer lines. But God was still aware, no matter what I was going through, he was aware of my dilemma. I lost my faith every once in a while, but I never lost my hope because hope was all I had left. I had to have hope that something would change. Remember I told you I had a 13-year-old? I was raising alone, no parents, no family. Now listen to me. I would have given up had it not been for that little girl. But she was watching, and I had to get through this for her, and that is what kept me alive. A few years later, five or six years later, after living like this, I heard about a healing service at a little Methodist church. Got any Methodists out there? Any Methodists? No? No? Oh, okay, good church. Oh, it's a good church. But for those of you that doubt, a quiet little church with serene music that God can't meet a person and heal them, guess what? That pastor was spirit-filled. He got kicked out of the Methodist church, pastor. He got kicked out. He was spirit-filled. Had to start his own church. But he prayed for people and they were healed. This little quiet little man. And that's what I need, a gentle prayer from a quiet person. But you know, when I went to that church that night, I didn't know that Five and a half years later, after my injury, God met me and he set me up and things were getting ready to change. Five and a half years later. That night, I walked through the door of this little Methodist church and a man approached me and said, Ma'am, I don't want to offend you, but I believe God's told me something is wrong with your head. And, <laughs> and I would like to pray for you tonight. That's a, that's a prophecy, right? And I would like to pray for you tonight, if I may. Well, that really took me off guard, and I laughed and said, you have no idea what's wrong with my head. And later, I got the courage to go up to that man and his prayer partner for prayer. And to make a long story short, let me tell you what God did that night. God showed that man everything that was wrong with my head. Amen. He saw the darkness in the back part of my brain. He saw the darkness in the frontal lobe. He prayed for the synapses to start rerouting. He prayed for the signals to respond. He prayed for the left and the right hemispheres to communicate. Yes, he did. He commanded the spirit of pain away. He prayed for all demonic holds of trauma to release me. He prayed almost three hours until we were completely soaked on the floor from the power of the Holy Spirit upon us. He prayed for me to be, to be able to reason and function and be able to take care of myself and my daughter. And he prayed for my brain to function the way God intended it to. Wow, I had never experienced anything like that before. But guess what? I went home changed. I went home changed. Remember I told you I couldn't concentrate for more than 15 minutes? I started knocking out eight-hour days on the computer, and I completed what I had been trying to do for two years in three months. 
Yes. I worked for two years, and it was a miracle, and I became an ordained minister just five months later. Now, the work was not finished yet, though. This is what I need you to understand. The work was not finished. It was not an instantaneous miracle for some things, yes, but not the whole thing. That man continued to pray for me every Wednesday night. Every Wednesday night. And that man became the advocate for me to God the Father and Jesus Christ. And his prayers over the next years changed my physical condition. What the doctor said would never happen after two years, five years, it did. After five years, when they said it was not possible, God proved them wrong. Now, the cool thing about all this is... Um, every time I talk to my neurologist, because I still have to keep in touch with him, he calls me his miracle child. And he says, Carolyn, I don't use your name, but I tell them your story to give them hope. Because when you came in here, you had no hope. But you are hope. That man also knows the married to a minister. And that, that was from prayer. He knows that. The man that prayed for me every Wednesday night for months, guess what? He became my husband. <laughs> Yes. That's my sweetheart. Now, has the road been long? Yes. I still had migraines for 10 more years. I walked with a cane for 14 years. I sometimes still lose my balance and fall. I still have some memory problems. I still have some difficulty with sentences. I'll ha- That's why I have all these notes in front of me. I, I have difficulty sometimes talking to people because the thought will be there, but it never makes it out my mouth all at once. It, get, it gets stuck. There's a disconnect. I'd have difficulty making sentences, and I'd still get flooding at times. And then there were times that Bill and I would teach t- together, and often I would have to stop in the middle of the lesson and say, and Bill's going to pick it up from here, because suddenly the words on the page would become foreign to me. I couldn't understand what they said. My healing was a process, and it was not all instantaneous. But the point is, yes, at times the way was really dark, It was dark. It was truly the midnight of my soul. And why did this happen? I will never know. I will never know until we see the Lord. Why did it take so long? Some things five years, some things ten, some things fourteen, some never resolved. I don't know. I have no answers. Sometimes we look at our timing and we expect God to heal on our timetable. And when he does, it's great. And I am thankful for miracles too, that instantaneous. But also we do see there are healings. But one thing I want to get across, and I want you to hear this. When it looked like God was not going to heal me, the healing was already in the works. I just couldn't see it. I had to keep my faith. I couldn't lose my hope. And my hope was in the Lord. And that's why I survived. You say, but Pastor Carolyn, I thought you just have to have faith. Well, let me explain it. You know, this scripture, Hebrews 11, 1, it says, Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance in what we do not see. Faith is now, but hope is in the future based on what is going to happen. And sometimes hope seems dark. It seems like a risk. And in darkness... Sometimes our faith falters. Mine did. And sometimes love seems abandoned. Sometimes I felt totally abandoned by God. I didn't understand. But hope is what we hang on to when all is darkness. Faith is confidence and assurance for those things that we cannot see, but we can hope for. Psalms 33, 22 says, may your unfailing love be with us, Lord, even as we put our hope in you. Psalms 135 says, I wait for the Lord. My whole being waits in his word. I put my hope. I put my hope in the Lord through trusting his word. I saturated myself with the word. I didn't know how to pray for myself, but God sent someone to pray for me. In what doctors can or cannot do, 
it's only in excess of what God himself can and does. Anything else is excess. So when the doctors can't do anything, you have to go back to the basics. You have to go back to hope. And you have to claim the promises. And that's how I maintain my hope. And that's how it brought me through. Remember that scripture? I've really got a couple more minutes here. It says, Hebrews 10, 23, let us hold unswervingly, hold on to the hope we professed. For he who promised is faithful. We're into instructed to hold on. Hope is future. I don't know what tomorrow may bring, and you don't know what tomorrow may bring. I never expected to happen to me what did. But the thing I did learn is God is faithful, and our hope must be in Him. We can trust God. We can trust God. I encourage you, if you have some physical conditions, Get your scriptures out about physical healing. If you have emotional issues, get your scriptures out. Put them all over the kitchen. Put them on your bathroom cabinet. Put them on your bed, whatever. If you have problems with emotions, with family, with finances, with your marriage, whatever, get your scriptures out and hold fast to God's promises. God is true to his word. He will not and cannot lie. Now, we're wrapping up here, and prayer ministers, I want to speak to you for a minute. You prayer ministers, or anyone that prays for anyone, can be the agent of change for others through the hope that you can help instill into the person in front of you because of the trials and tribulations you've had. And because you know what the word says. And see, your testimony to them when you're praying for them, it can change a person's situation. It can change their attitude from discouragement and disillusionment, depression, maybe even despondency. It can change it to faith, hope, and expectation that God is still with them, still with them, has not left them, and will see them through. If everyone would stand, please. Prayer ministers, if you'd come forward and find your places. I don't know if anyone here is struggling tonight. I know there are some people that are not here. I've seen them on Facebook that are sick and have been hurt and are suffering. But I hope they hear this tonight. If you're struggling with a physical need and you haven't seen the promises of God fulfilled... I want you to get ready and get to come forward when they're all set up here. God desires you to continue to trust him and his word and hold out until you see the promises fulfilled. He wants you to have joy and peace. So please come. Please come. Find your places to be prayed for. Father God, I just thank you for each and every one that is here tonight, God. There may be some that are despondent. There may be some without hope, some that have suffered atrocities that we can't even imagine. Lord, they may not even know what they have suffered. Lord, as they come to be prayed for, please come. Each and every one of you, please come. Lord, as they come to be prayed for, I pray that you will meet them where they are. That you would help them know you are the God of comfort. You're the God of miracles. God, that you're the God that hears every breath of their prayers. You know their thoughts even before they think. Father, you are here to hear and answer their prayers. Now, Lord, I just pray that there'll be miracles here tonight, that there'll be miracles here tonight of people that are being prayed for. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for joining us today at Revive Us Now at our YouTube channel. Remember to click that subscribe button to Revive Church and share this video with a friend. And if you'd like to support this ministry, go to reviveusnow.com forward slash give.